Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. So thank you so much for being here. I know it is a, a crazy week and uh, very busy schedules with winter break coming up, but I, I know this is a, a hot topic, especially with all of the screen time that kids are getting with school. So I understand the need. So we've got internet safety and screen time, and we've set it up so that internet safety is a standalone, that's gonna be first, and then screen time is second. And we have um, some other, some new presenters, if you've been with us, uh, most of you have been with us for at least one other event. We've got some, some new presenters today joining us. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda Giordano, I'm the school counselor at Nettlehorst. And I have, Anna is my other counselor of the, the plural counselors in Coffee with the Counselors. Hi everybody, my name is Anna Solis. I am the school counselor at Meyer. And the Nettle Horse social worker, Jackie Gustafson is here with us. She helped with this presentation too. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Gustafson, the school social worker at Nettle Horse. Nice to meet all of you. And then we have Anna Mancuso and she will be presenting our second half. She's a teacher, first grade teacher and a lot more. You're, you do a lot at school, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep it with first grade teacher. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Hi everyone. So up first is internet safety, and if you have a um, if you have another device with you, uh, you can join with. Um, in just a second, it should pop up with some instruction. Oh, activity unavailable. Well, Anna, I wonder if you um, if you just access the presentation, if it'll activate that for us. Okay, I am on the present. I'm, I am on my presentation. I'm on another screen. Hmm. And I'm in present mode on another screen. Oh, that could be why, because you're okay. presenting. It's probably not allowing me access. Okay, let me see. I'm not on present mode. I'm not on present mode anymore. Let's okay. try now. Ah. Uh, wow. No such luck. Let me exit and come back in. And if it doesn't work, that's not a problem. We'll do it in the chat. Yep. All right, and now if I can just get it to present for me. There we go. And maybe, maybe not. Let's go. Nope. All right, so I am going to pop out of present mode for just a second so that way we can see. And we tested it earlier and it worked for us. And it worked just fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know how to get... We'll just ask, yeah, we'll ask you to respond in the chat because I can't even get to the um, instructions to come up. So the average age at which students in Illinois join their first social networking site is 10. Do you think that that is true or false? Go ahead and you can respond in the chat. The average age at which students in Illinois first join the social networking site. True, true, false, true. You know, like the addition of the sad face. <laughs> true. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna keep you uh, guessing. Um, social networking would be Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, Snapchat. Um, I think Roblox is is more classified as a game mm -hmm. than social yeah. network. There is the ability for it to be social. That's a good question because they, they do tend to overlap so much. Right. All right. So then our second pop quiz question, the majority of apps used by Illinois youth are for texting. True or false? The majority of apps used by Illinois youth are for texting. True, false, true, 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 false. Okay, pretty split on that one. And by default, social networking site profiles are set to public. 
So when you make an account on a social networking site, is it automatically set to public? True or false? True, 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 true. Seem to have some more agreement here. Okay, so time for the answers. Let me pop back into presentation mode. And um, Anna, these were, I stole your slides. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> but you can cover the answers. So now question number one, the average age at which students in Illinois join their first social networking site is 10 and that is true. Um, and, you know, a lot of the sites require kids to be 13 years or older, but kids are still under the age of 13 are making, um, are getting access to these sites and joining as members. Um, the majority of apps used by Illinois youth are for texting. The answer is false. Photo and video sharing are two very popular uses of the apps. You heard um, of all of the all of the photo and video apps. We've got Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. I, I can't even keep up with endless, them all. right? Yeah, and it's like a new one comes up, and it's like something that becomes trendy among the kids, and the adults are the last to find out. By default, social networking site profiles are set to public, and that is true. Um, According to a survey conducted in Illinois in 2014, 30 percent of students don't use privacy settings to limit what others can see about them on social networking sites. And not too long ago at Meyer, we had um, someone come and do a, a presentation on digital safety. And when she was talking to the students about um, privacy settings, a lot of them admittedly said that they really had no idea, you know, like how much, how much they can sort of set up their account to make it more private. So it was something that they were learning and they, and they talked a lot about like what happens when your profile is public. And it's so, it sounds so counterintuitive. Like why wouldn't you just set it to private? Cause that's a safer thing to do, but it defeats the purpose of it being a social networking site. So I right. think that's probably why they set them to public. So we do have a lot of safety, internet safety tips for parents. Um, you know, first of all, it's important to educate yourself. So what are the apps that are out there? What are the programs and the games that are out there and what are their capabilities? Because Roblox is a great example. It is a game, but it also has this, this social piece. So are the games that your child playing, are they collaborative games online with other people? Are there options to, um, to create your own private rooms or your own private servers? So just the, um, your, the kids' friends can play with them? Or is it always a, an open to the public type of thing? So doing that that education, like that, doing that research to educate yourself is really important. Um, take an interest in your kid's online world. I, I think that you can get involved and that's kind of a way to educate yourself. Um, so you kind of align with their interests and see what's going on and how they're using the, um, how they're using the apps and the games and the websites that they're on don't forget that you are in charge and so you get to set the rules and you know I've, I've seen parents that are really hesitant to set boundaries and limits and you know take devices away when they're used inappropriately i don't want to set any kind of internet controls you know i don't want them to be mad at me at the end of the day you're in charge and your kid's safety is your responsibility um, and hopefully they'll get over their hurt feelings once they realize that you're looking out for their best interest Another important piece is to help your kids think critically because we we do lessons. I know that Ms. Proudfoot, our um, LMC, our library teacher and technology teacher does lessons about filtering through what sources are reliable and which ones aren't. And um, I think that there are some really good examples out there of how doctored everything can be. Even talking to your kid about, you know, when people post things online, they're only going to be posting the positives. You never get to see the negatives that are going on in people's lives. So to create that, that awareness, uh, talking about filters and Photoshop, I did a lesson with eighth grade last year that had, and I think Ms. Proudfoot said that she shows a similar video that shows the process of a photo shoot from in-person to the 
final markup on computer and you can see the transformation with all of the airbrushing and you know wardrobe and hairstylist and makeup and then all the photoshop that happens so just talking about those things um because internet safety is also about protecting their self-esteem too so um so that they know what what they're looking at what's reliable and how things can be manipulated amanda do you want to share your screen your I oh I don't know how that happened. I think it might have been when you we were trying to get the quiz to work. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. So then we also want to remember to work with your child. They're going to be much more willing to kind of accept the limitations or accept the boundaries if they've if they feel like they're a partner in it. Uh, if you give them some of their um, some of the the choice making uh, guided choice making of course um, talk to your kids about the benefits of internet safety why is it important for for them to be safe um, you know and you can also give them some some tips and um, tricks on like how to talk to your friends about well, these are my these are the limits like I can't I can't do that you know tell your kids that it, they can blame it on you as the parent you know use 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 Patsy um, but also ask your children what they think healthy guidelines are and you might be surprised by some of the things they come up with they might not want those guidelines for themselves but if they're helping generate the ideas you'll get a lot more buy-in and then really be clear about your expectations don't leave room for loopholes we all know that the kids are going to seek them out <laughs> they're going to exploit any any gray zone gray areas um well you said a b and c but you didn't say d so i figured that was okay all right, Anna. Um, okay, so our next section is setting and enforcing expectations. So one of the things that we wanna not forget is that children tend to thrive when expectations are clear. And so we should constantly remember that. And in you know wanting to sort of create these expectations, it's important to make a plan or develop a contract with your child when they get their first um, device or when they're going to be given the opportunity to be on social media. So talk to the kids about how you're going to be monitoring that technology use and include that in your contract. Um, you know, talk with the kids about what are the consequences if you don't follow through on this contract and then maintain a conversation. You know what, I think it's important to sort of continue the conversation and you use that opportunity to stay connected and build like a trusting relationship, right? So that they know that you're giving them an opportunity to interact with their friends on, on a social platform, but that they also have expectations that they need to meet. Okay, so we're gonna do, it's like started to come up, but then it doesn't come up again. That's fine. So this was gonna be interactive, but we'll just have you kind of reflect on this because this is gonna be different for everyone. And so um, thinking about, I'm gonna try and make this as big as I can here. So bear okay. with me. So thinking about the expectations, we've got, I will have passwords to all your devices and accounts at an agreed upon time. All technology will stay in common areas, not including bedrooms or bathrooms. You may only accept friend or follower requests from people you and I both know. In conversation, text and profiles, you are to refrain from sharing your full name, school, address, town, and phone number. We will have open communication about the positives and negatives of your online experiences, and you will obtain my permission to download new apps and get new games. Like think about those and think about which of those would be at the, the higher end of your list. What would your expectations be for your child when it comes to internet safety? Um, and then you'll know which, which ones to really hone in on, which ones you're, you want to um, strictly enforce and you want to kind of really guide that the, that policy and then which ones are you you know you're are you willing to maybe bend a little bit for um and this this might even vary from kid to kid you know if you have multiple children I'll give you a second just to kind of 
think about those expectations. Amanda, uh, this is Erica. I have a question of, about something that's not listed here that I kind of learned from my friends uh, who have teenagers, and that was checking the browser history. Um, I've heard many <laughs> quite sordid tales of uh, parents checking, you know, and, and finding out that their kids were watching YouTube videos about like crazy stuff and, you know, kind of going down that rabbit hole of what the social dilemma um, documentary kind of shows about how kids are on YouTube and they'll start getting fed like progressively more um, extreme stuff. So what, you know, it, it, it's funny because I feel like I, I kind of liken it to when I was young, like my parent looking at my diary or something, you know, it's like what, and, and my kids are so young that I, I'm like fearing having to do all this one day, but I mean, what are, age guidelines or like what what is the deal i guess about you know when it is or isn't appropriate to talk about look i can you know find out what you're looking at yeah i think that that's a really good uh, that's a really good question i think that it, you know it, it really i think it depends it depends on the your kid you know i talked recently with a kid who said you know i'm i this is a thing that i'm interested in and um, this is the type of book that i'm interested in reading and so I went and I looked for other books. I got a recommendation. I started reading the description and went, oh my God, my parents, if they think I'm reading this, if they see my history, they're going to freak out. And I was like, but did you, did you actually download the book? You know, like that kid was so worried because they knew it was off limits that I don't think that that parent would ever need to check that kid's history because they know that their kid makes those good, healthy decisions and can, and then did actually talk to them about it. Um, so I think that if you have a kid that you, you know is not gonna be open and who pushes those boundaries, it might be a good idea to, I always say to give that expectation so that they're not surprised and so they're not blindsided. Um, I think that if you give the, the warning, not you know, warning, but make it clear that, okay, so I'm, I trust you to, I'm trusting you to do the right thing, however, um, if there comes a time, I, I do need to check just to make sure that you're on the right track. Um, yeah, yeah, and then you have the savvy kids who know how to delete their search history mm -hmm. and know about the incognito window. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, yeah, it's like to me, I guess, you know, and again, I, I do think it comes back to knowing your child. I mean, if if they're the kind of child that like maybe is techno technologically savvy, but you're not like worried about them, you know, in, in certain ways. I think that's one thing. I think that if a child is deleting their search history, then that in and of itself could be, you know, a reason Absolutely. for just like a conversation about, Absolutely. hey, you know, I, I know you can delete your history. Right. And so like that makes me worried about like, is there, you know, what is it that you're looking at? You know, like, like I think everything can be like a reason to have a conversation or a learning Absolutely. moment or whatever, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, some of the stuff, like it breaks my heart that I know some of my friends' kids have seen that they can't unsee, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's just like terrifying to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. And I think that it can be a really good conversation. I, you know, it, if you, if you set the expectation that you are going to be checking periodically and you find something that is shocking, I think it's important to go in with non-judgment and, and say like, hey, I realize that there, there are a lot of things that, you know, people are curious about, kids are curious about. I know that there are things that might be hard to ask a parent or, or an, another adult or you might be afraid to ask about. And so like, I'm just wondering what, you know, what was it that led you there and, and how can we get that um, answered or, you know, like get you information about that. Like what was, what was your intention? Um, and like, let's think of the, the good side and the bad side of this. Um, Cause you also, you never know. I think it's really easy to jump to a conclusion, um, but you, you have no idea if it was a misclick that someone sent them, if, if it was a phrase that they heard that they honestly didn't know the definition of that sent them somewhere, you know, um, so I think it, it can be a good conversation to have those, you know, those, those talks like we did look when we saw something <laughs> that, that just raised, raised our eyebrow. Right. Yeah. Um, I was going to, this is one of the, the resources that I'm going to show later, but um, let me switch over. 
to this tab. I want to make sure I found the right page. There's Parenting Connect is a website that's put out by um, the group that makes Second Step. It's the social emotional learning curriculum that our teachers use at Meadowhorse. I don't know if you use it at Meyer. We use it at Meyer as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, they have a whole, I'll just share my tab and while you're you can, while you watch me look for the thing that I'm looking for, you can see the resources. They have a lot of videos from, from um, this expert. And then they have videos where they interview parents and they interview teens. Um, one of the, I wasn't sure if it was under responsibility or screen time, but they do have a screen time section and they have, I'm pretty sure that one of the, um, one section of videos is about those kinds of talks with, you know, between parents and kids. Um, you know, like, how does it make you feel to know that your parent might be checking? Here's how much online privacy should teens get? And they have interviews from teens. So you can kind of get a feel for how that conversation might go with your kid and what a kid's perspective might be. Um, tips on how to start these conversations. Uh, here's, you know, get talking is stooping ever okay. Um, and that might be a good way to start a conversation with your kid. Hey, after tonight, you know, Hey, I went to this presentation and the topic of, of, you know, snooping came up. What are your thoughts? Um, right. that might be a really good way to broach the conversation before you need to actually snoop and bring something up. Okay. I think also to sharing just like the the dangers you know that exist i think it's important to have a conversation with kids about that as well because then that creates a level of caution in them and i think that you know given the times that we're living in it's important to sort of support this notion of being cautious um and being mindful and like amanda said like maintaining an open conversation with each other i think that that is extremely important mm -hmm. oh thanks liz for putting the um the link in there um, all right. Good, good question. Good conversation. Um, some more internet safety tips. Uh, these are for, for kids. You want to teach them yappy. Um, I hadn't heard of this, but I saw this in several places. And so they don't want to give out your full name, address, password, phone number, plans. You just never know what your audience is, is intending to do with that information. And, um, you know, always be cautious when talking to strangers. Again, with these games that are online, you never know who's on the other end and you feel like they're a friend because you, you've played Roblox together for two and a half years, um, but don't ever meet with someone and, and treat them like a stranger. And then try to empower your kids to tell an adult whenever there's something that makes them feel unsafe or uncomfortable. Um, you know, even, even a small thing, like hey, this came up and I wasn't sure how to handle it. Like role play those with your kid. That, that could be a really, really good step for internet safety. And then another, like this is kind of internet safety 101, talking about passwords. What is a strong password? Why is that important? Um, there's a nice video that I think would be good for um, even, and that'll be linked in the slide deck. And talk about the importance of accepting friend requests and, and follows from people that they know. Um, even if it's a friend of a friend of a friend, you still kind of have to, to figure that out, you know, if, is that a good, is that a good decision to make or not? All right. I yeah. think one of the things that we want to stress, we can't stress enough, right, is the idea of the importance of having conversations with kids. So, and these are not just conversations that you have one time and then forget about this conversation, but it's almost like, almost like put it into your calendar to revisit these topics with frequency. You know, like where do you spend most of your online time? Um, how do you decide who gets to follow or friend you? Um, what do you share, post, download, upload, and view? Can I review your profile with you? So asking your child to share what they have set up as their profile. What do you do if someone you don't know offline starts private messaging you or sending you comments and you're commenting on your posts? So engaging in these conversations and then talking through like the what ifs, like what to do next if you encounter these things. And, and I think it's really important that, you know, kids are evolving and changing. So if you have this conversation in the spring, remember to revisit this conversation before the summer starts. And then the summer, you know, comes along and then you're in the fall, like seasonally or once a month, like just touch base to see where they are because, you know, kids are 
evolving and changing and their friends are changing and they're meeting new people and making different connections. And so it's always really important to maintain that conversation um, and keep it fluid, you know, so that it is something that is going to change and like your perception or your own opinion can change about something with time because of an experience, the same conversation should be had with kids, um, you know, just to maintain the conversation and keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. I like that. What, the part you said about, you know, like even their, their friends change, then that one, one or two friend changes can shift the dynamics. And right. I've seen so many times I've heard so many times where it was like, I didn't do it, but my friends started this thing online. Right. You know, they said something, they pulled me into a group chat and I didn't want to be there, but there I was, you know, kids that you wouldn't otherwise expect they, they would never be the starter. Um, so that's, right. a, that's a good thing to point out. And then we just have some questions for you as parents. So prepare yourself thinking about, you know, what, how would you handle if you handle it, if you find out that your, your child ends up being the, the cyber bully in a situation, um, what are you going to do if you find out that they have created some account that you didn't approve? What if you find out that they've lied about their age? or that they've been posting, you know, a hate speech is strong, but you know, if they've been posting hateful, hurtful things online, um, if they have been sending or receiving inappropriate videos or pictures, it's important for you to role play or play through in your mind those situations so you're prepared for that conversation. Um, you never know what might happen. And so just thinking about it, preparing yourself in advance, just in case. Right. So, that's wrapping up our internet safety section. We do have some resources. Um, we mentioned earlier creating a contract with your child. The Illinois uh, Attorney General's Office has a great um, internet safety section and they have this contract. And you can print it and go over it with your child and you can both sign it and it makes it feel really official that there's this piece of paper and they can go and reflect back on it. And then uh, the, this book is actually from um, the American Girl Doll uh, Company. It is a phenomenal book and it's it's set up like a, a workbook and it's um, it's a couple years old, but it's still super relevant. And I would highly recommend it for, I would say maybe even third grade mm -hmm. um, yes. and up, but it, it covers everything and it's got quizzes, it's got practice scenarios, it's fabulous. Um, Custodio, I've listed in here and on the screen time section. It's a parental control app that's free for using on one device. Um, and it's got the basic protection features. Some of it is internet safety, but some of it is also screen time limiting. So that's why it's in both sections. Um, Parenting Connect, which I showed you. Panda Security, that article shows how to set up parental, um, parental controls on um, Apple products, on um, YouTube specifically, it goes through a couple different like device types, web common websites and things like that. It, it had a lot of great knowledge. And then the Net Smarts Kids website uh, had a lot of, for younger kids, really good internet safety, internet smarts activities, videos, stuff that you, they can do online and um, worksheets that you can print out too. So all of that will be linked in the slide deck for you. And I just wanted to give a chance for anybody to ask questions that they had about internet safety before we transition to screen time. House party, um, from what I have it, I use it. I use it, I've been using it with my family during the pandemic actually. Um, it is, it's preloaded with just a couple of games um, and it's like, you know, I'm just gonna open it right now and see. Um, the the games are from what i remember pg enough i think you make friends just by and like connecting with other with people maybe in your phone book um i think so but like if i was to join house party and even though amanda and amanda and i may be linked on house party all of my friends would automatically be linked with amanda's friends so it creates like a larger group Got it. Kind of like LinkedIn, your mm -hmm. first, second, third network. Right. Uh, um, but the games, and they've added new games. Um, they started with really simple things like a, just a drawing game, uh, trivia games, things like that. Um, 
Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does because kids end up getting connected with each other through like, you know, multiple layers. There's multiple layers of people that they may know. And then it's a little bit more difficult to figure out who it is that your kids are talking to. I think it's really popular along or, or among like the middle schoolers because they get to connect with friends from other schools that way. It's almost like pretty instant where you're, you know, you meet somebody through a friend and then it just kind of spirals that way. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at it. You can add by name, add from your contacts on your phone, add from Facebook, or they have um, profile links that you can share. So, yeah, yeah. Again, I think it's one of those things where if you have that conversation about can we go, can we walk through the, you know this app together mm -hmm. and just to make sure that you know you're you're connected with the right people. I think I think it can be pretty harmless, but then you've got, um, you know, whoever, if I join, if I invite Anna, Anna might be able to invite, you know, the next person to the room. And so, right. yeah, but it's a smaller, it's small. The limitation on the group size is I think eight. So a little bit more limited than something like, uh, you know, an online game. Good question. Anything else? Well, with that, I am going to turn it over to Anna Mancuso and Donna Hempy, um, who joined us also. She is one of our middle school teachers here at Nettlehorst, and they are going to talk all about screen time. All right. Thank you to both of you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anna Mancuso. Don't leave. It's the second half. It's just as exciting <laughs> as the first. Um, <laughs> I am a first grade teacher at Nettle Horse, and um, if, if you don't know me, I'm also a parent of two children at Nettle Horse. Um, I became aware of the screen time battle when my children were young. I remember um, my, my friends would say, oh, look how smart my child is. They're, you know, they're scrolling. Um, <laughs> and so I felt as a parent and as an educator, I felt it was very important for me to research, um, research all of these things with screens. Um, I, and in addition to that, I, I remember when I would take away the screen, my daughter would temper tantrum. And um, I remember I just had a lot of these questions in my head. I was wondering what what all this was, what the benefits and the downside of all of this was going to be. So along this road, I found that there was a ton of research about this. And I found out that there's a lot of pros and cons to this new way of uh, life for children. And so um, understanding how the brain works, what it needs and how it's affected has been my focus. I'm also very aware of the battles that the parents are going through um, with peer pressure and whatnot. And I think that at the end of the day, it's healthy to reflect on what's important. And so um, I am, I joined with uh, Miss Humpy, the lovely Miss Humpy, um, and we have been working together um, for a few years on this. And with all this research, we decided that it would be very important for us to share, share what we know um, to help other parents find a balance in a world full of screens and help um, others kind of figure out how that can look in our homes. Um, so that's a little bit about me and I'll let Miss Hempy introduce herself as well. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Anna said, uh, she and I have worked together talking about these things for quite a while. Um, I've been a middle school teacher for 20 years now. So middle school is my jam. But I can tell you it's the hardest stage. Well, not the hardest, but it's a very hard stage. And over 20 years, the significant difference in what kids are dealing with today versus 15, 20 years ago, I can't even it's a it, it, night and day, the pressures, and the majority of it has to do with the online world that they're growing up in. So for me as an educator, it's really important to understand how this is impacting them as it's social emotionally and learning. And it has huge impact on all of those things. And the research, like Anna said, she and I eat this stuff up and not in a good way. We're like, we want to know more because it's so important this time period. It's so limited. So we're very passionate about it. We're happy to be here with you. Um, the main reason that this came to me is my nephew, who's now an adult, um, was a video game addict. And he was a gamer a while ago. My sister-in-law didn't say, oh, he's, you know, he's having fun with his friends. And it kind of took, shook the whole world of him for many years. He got in the army and got out of it, sort of detoxed that way. 
But ever since then, um, she started an organization. And so she's gotten me reading stuff. And I'll share that with you after because it's a really good resource for parents. But just learning about how this is impacting our children is super important. And so we just want to, and, and we're all learning together, to be honest. It's all new. And so uh, what we want to, Anna and I thought, we love the things that um, they're presenting about internet safety. And that's so important because so many of our kids are on it and we just need to be aware. And in addition to knowing the content, time is such a critical part of this piece. Not only what are they doing, but how long they're on because it is changing their brains. It is. And we want to share what we're learning with you. And we'd love to talk about it as long as we want to. <laughs> um, and basically my last thing to say before we introduce is, um, I just made some notes because I can talk and ramble. We're all advocates for our children and we want the best for them. And we want a healthy, balanced life. And I can say that as much as these devices have inund inundated their world, the people making these devices, they're not interested in the well-being of our children. That's our job. Parents, teachers, counselors, like we want the best for them. So not only is it we have these things, they're in our lives, but what are we going to do about it? And what do we need to know about it? So that's what we want to talk about. Anna and I are just hitting a few myths. Um, so one thing I'll say is the smaller the screen, the less control you're going to have of all of this because they're hiding, they're away, they're private, they're with them. So that's just something to think about as you are with younger children and that, what we're introducing and when. Huge questions. All right, Anna, I'll stop. Hit it. Yes. No, that's fine. Um, I think that we wanted to start with myths. Um, I know when I'm um, meeting with parents and we're chatting that that's a lot of the times my my what I'm hearing from parents are these myths. And so I wanted to address those first. So I'm going to kind of read through and then we'll kind of go over um, a few highlights of these. So the first myth that we want to talk about tonight is that giving kids phones or computers will improve their school success. And the fact behind that is that kids tend to use the computers, phones, and other digital devices primarily for entertainment, not for learning purposes. So it is not surprising that the more time kids spend using screens or phones, including the computers, the internet, TV, video games, social media, or texting, the lower their academic grades are. Um, so interestingly, after about 30 to 45 minutes of total screen time, or total screen and texting time per day, kids' grades start to suffer. And in high school, kids who spend four or more hours um, on a screen, they actually have a full grade point lower than the kids who just spend 30 minutes or less a day with screens. And so that would be like, instead of getting a B, they would have a C, for example. Um, so what kids really need, um, they need engagement with reading, with reading, they need books. Um, and these, these, are, these two are powerful predictors of their school success. So exposing kids to books early and often is important. Um, they also need, we are, I heard a lot of questions earlier about this, so I'm very happy to share this as well. Um, space and work time away from distractions of computers and screens and phones. And so we recommend putting the computers in the common areas of your house, and that way you're able to monitor what they're doing. And then they're not just in in their room, um, not doing their work and doing other things. Uh, Miss Hempy, what else would can you add? Yeah, one thing just to note about this: obviously, in our current situation, they're on all the time, and this makes me shudder. I have to be honest because this is the opposite. We collect their phones in middle school. We don't want them to have anything to do with it. We want their focus. When we take trips as a group, we take their phones. We want them to socialize. So we're dealing with a situation we can't control. But when we can control it outside of education, if they're researching NASA. If they're watching a cooking show and learning how to do it, if they're, if they're FaceTiming grandma, those are great things. If they're just watching five hours of TikTok or you know scrolling about other people's lives that make them feel insecure, um, that does impact them. So we're talking the difference between educational use versus just entertainment. Um, and then the last thing that I would say is the reason the time matters is not only is it that they're doing these things, but when they're on a screen, they're not doing the things Anna mentioned. Um, but we're going to talk about, you know, they're not going to be, unless it's a Kindle, let's face it, that'd be great. Um, but they're not doing some of those other things that they need. Um, and I can tell you a lot of parents say that their kids are spending hours on homework. And my first question is, what's around them? Do they have their phone with them? And I said, buy them a calculator. You know, they don't need their phone for their calculator. Get an alarm clock. They're not going to focus. It's, it's much more alluring to get the phone. So yeah, that's my add on. I'm done, Anna. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, next myth. Um, the health concerns about screen time are overblown. And the fact is there's still so much to be learned about the long-term effects 
of screens on children, but there is evidence for exercising extreme caution. Screen use directly causes or contributes to a wide range of health issues, which we're gonna go over here shortly. So what kids really need, free play and natural light that fosters normal brain and eye development. They need physical activity. This is still crucial even for older children. Uh, they need strong face-to-face -face connections with family, teachers, and friends also critical to their emotional well-being, and sleep with a consistent routine. So setting up a time for them to run and become exhausted so they are able to go to sleep on time every day and keeping up with that routine daily. Um, I know there's more to talk about. Ms. Hempy, take it away. Well, all I would say is that whenever they're on a screen, that bullet list isn't happening. So it's a matter of, fine, they have a half hour here, there, but the kids who are living on it, it's an escape. Um, when kids start to be more comfortable in the virtual world than the real one, because they're having more success on a video game or they feel like, you know, they can create a different look because they can, you know, sh and they don't want to engage in the real one, it's a concern. So we want to give them the opportunity, but they need all of, especially younger, if they're not moving, if they're not fine motor skills, it's not something, it's something that gets pruned out. Um, the good news is it can bounce back, but it has to be purposeful. So they need all these things and screens seem to, they replace those things. So we need balance. I, I have a dog. I'm not sure if anyone else has a dog, but when you train your dog, you are supposed to, like Cesar Malone says, you're supposed to take them outside and exercise them and then bring them in and they're able to focus and they're able to learn. And then you can give them that reward. And so get your kids out, get them that exercise. And Miss Hempy tells me too, with my two kids, she's like, well, as long as you, you know, you make sure that you take your kids out and you, and, and they're getting their exercise and they're getting that in their interactions and they're getting their sleep. She's like, then if you have some screen time at the end, it's not a terrible thing. It's not like the worst thing in the world, but making sure that you have that. And then saying, once you get outside and run around a little bit, then we can sit down and have a screen in front of us. Um, but replacing it isn't um, going to do much good for your child. All right, next screen, please. And I, as I'm transitioning slides, I wanted to throw in there too. I think that one thing that you said was really important, Donna, that um, when, when kids are are using the screen interaction on a screen is replacement for interaction in the real world that's that's the that's an important line to note mm -hmm. um, you know I've definitely seen kids connect with others online and not all of them but I've seen some of them connect in a way online with people that they they haven't connected with in person um, that that has become a problem though when they aren't able to connect with anyone in person and for sure we do have marginalized kids we have kids that have really specific interests or really specific identities when we think about our LGBTQ community and um, like just really niche um, interests, you know, sometimes it is hard to connect in a school where you, you only have so many students. But if they're still able to make friends and keep re relationships in real life, I think that's okay. When, mm -hmm. when they can't, that's, that's a, a problem. So good, yeah. good point to raise. Good point, yeah. So here's the fun page. These are the, the health risks that we're going to uh, share with you. Um, screen time is associated with a lot of health risks, and I'm going to run through them, and then we'll go over and more in depth uh, what some of these are because there some of them are some there's some big words here. Um, subsequent att attention issues with ADHD symptoms in children ranging from one to 24. So ADHD is our keyword there. Um, obesity behavior problems, anxiety, depression, and suicide. That's a big one that Ms. Hempy can talk more about. Impaired academic performance, digital eye strain. Um, and then we added to this myopia and macular degeneration because we, we are familiar with eye strain, but myopia and macular degeneration are, are connected as well. And we'll go over what that is in a minute. Type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and irregular sleep. A couple slides back, I mentioned the importance of sleep. And here we have the problem. Uh, the blue light emitted from the screen suppresses melatonin production and it directly affects the circadian rhythms and sleep patterns. Sleep is essential to physical and mental health. Um, so the myopia, um, I have uh, little notes about what these specifically are. Um, myopia is, uh, the well, the diagnoses of these have doubled and researchers have related it to the increased screen use. And macular degeneration, which can cause blindness is associated with blue light exposure. Um, so we also have that light at night, often homework time. It's been linked with um, many 
sleep problems and myopia problems, macular degeneration and all that, and including a risk of cancer. Um, and I'll let Ms. Hemby explain a little bit more about those. Well, I think um, some of the things that we see in school is the attention and um, obviously, and I have never in my 20 years had more kids tell me they're anxious and depressed. I've never, and I've worked in four states. I have worked with all different populations of students um, and I, this is another conversation, but social media anxiety is a thing. And I am thankful I never had to live through social media as a child. It was not made for children. That's why they emotionally can't manage it very well. Um, it's hard for adults to manage it, let's face it. And their brains are not developed yet. They're not ready for all of this, this pressure. They never get a break. It's around the clock. So I have a lot of feelings about that, but we'll talk about that another day if you're interested. <laughs> um, but in, in ADHD, what's really interesting is I, I, I have some friends who are medical professionals that work in this field. Um, a friend, her name is Dr. Victoria Dunkley. She's a detox program for ch children. She coined this phrase electronic screen syndrome. And all these parents are, are medicating their children and saying they have all these attention problems. They can't focus. They can't do this. So we, we need to put them on Ritalin or whatever. And so a lot of times, well, many doctors will say, unfortunately, there's too much medication being prescribed first, is what's your screen life with your child? Take them off the screens for, take, take a week, take 30 days is ideal. See if those symptoms go away. And a majority of the time, all of that is related to the dysregulation of their brain because of the light that Anna was talking about, the lack of sleep, the dopamine effect that goes through with all these games their body is just on all the time. And then it's time to sit in school. And when you have, when you're surrounded by a high, a low effort, high reward activity, such as video games, a low effort, high reward, the reward is all the, the chemical releases in their brain when they're experiencing all of these things, like a ding on their phone. Um, then they go to school and it's high effort, low reward, right? So you have, you have to put a lot of effort in to get some letter that means something someday they're not, they're, they're, their brain is, is dysregulated at this point. They're not. So there's a lot tied to that. So we really urge people to think about that before medicating, before saying, oh, they've got this problem. What is their screen life? And if I take that away, which by the way, they may tantrum and freak out. And that's another sign that it's too much. And there's a little tantrum, but I mean, I, I have stories. I read of people kicking down doors you know, throwing things out. I mean, it, the rage that comes if, if it's too much. So that's the, it's hard to take it away because you don't want the tantrum, but the tantrum is a sign that maybe something's going on. Um, if it's extreme, let's face it, there's always tantrums. Um, so that's the big one I like to focus on is that, that the behavior, the attention issues, they're connected. So not everybody, some people are fine, but if you start to see things like that, it might be too much, too much screen time. That's it, Anna. I'll stop. I think we're ready. Um, some other risks are uh, screen use negatively affects communication skills and ability to empathize. This is what Ms. Giordano was mentioning earlier. Um, a 2014 study from UCLA showed that middle schoolers' ability to recognize nonverbal emotions through facial expressions went up to after five days of a device-free at a device-free camp. Um, so that's an interesting one. Internet addiction is a growing social issue. 50% of teens feel that they are addicted to their devices and 59% of parents agree. Data security issues, which was mentioned earlier, threaten kids' privacy and expose them to unwanted targeted marketing. We have seen, uh, if you've seen Social Dilemma, you are uh, aware a little bit about that. Um, we have some more resources for you, for you in a minute. Um, but the, uh, the idea of giving your child a phone is giving them the opportunity to be exposed to everything and not just phone, but access to the internet in many forms. So, um, Ms. Hempy? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of the communication, like kids are more comfortable sitting together on phones together than actually talking to each other. Um, I know Mr. Dono uh, and Ms. Mink, so both, we all gone on these trips together when the kids don't have the phones and they actually thank us. Thank you so much. It was so nice to, we, none of us felt the fear of missing out. Nobody had a phone and we actually talked to each other and we felt calmer. They thanked us. I mean, these are the kids and they love their phones, you know? So they, they need a break. They need us as the adults to slow it down. And, I mean, let's face and, it. 
I love my phone too, but I would be right. fine with having a night out without it. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And, and you want to make sure you can, right? Because it gets to the point with some kids that they, they can't imagine. I mean, suicide rates because people say they were going to take their phone away or their video game away. And that's been, a, that's been reported, you know, the emergency rooms are reporting way more people coming in with suicide threats than they've ever seen at that age. So there's a lot going on. And again, not everybody is going to be affected, but I think as parents, especially young children, you know, if there's a risk for something, we don't want to set them up for it. We want to be really prepared. And so, you know, the, the best advice that everyone has given that I've heard is delay, delay, delay as long as you can, because they're going to be fine. Anna said, they're not going to miss out. They're not going to be technologically behind. They are, they're savvy. They got this. These things are made for anyone to operate. Um, what they do need is the skills of communication, socialization, uh, critical thinking. They need patience. They need coping skills. A lot of that gets replaced when they go cry and grab a phone. You know, they don't cope. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Sextortion is a thing a lot of the young girls face, which is the FBI puts a warning out on that, which is, you know, they don't know who they're talking to online. I know that Ms. Giordano, they were talking about this. And then they take a picture and it's somebody they don't know. And they're actually, this happens all the time. Um, and then that picture is used to extort them. And this actually happens in schools too with, with their kids the same age. Oh, I'm going to share that picture with so-and-so if you don't send me another one or you don't get someone else. And these girls feel trapped in this. So again, we want to really think about how are we setting our kids up um, for, they, they're not mature enough to handle all these decisions. They want to fit in, they want to feel, but this, it's so impulsive and you can't take it back. So we just want to be really thoughtful about when we're giving it to them and how we're talking about it with them. So that's it for me. Well, in this slide too, uh, aside from remote learning, because we know that remote learning is, is forcing these children right. on computers more than normal. But um, aside from that, in order for them to develop their um, empathy skills, or criti critical thinking skills, and um, the ability to collaborate, screens should be limited. Um, and so being a parent, being their parent and setting these rules is extremely important. And you can see um, there's a zero option next to all of these. <laughs> and so it goes up just ever so slightly. To, and you can even see, I think by the time they get to eighth grade, it's still not even an hour. Um, so take a look at where your child is right now and keep that in mind, keep that in the back of your head, um, that these are recommendations um, for screen time limits. That's all I have to say about that slide. We can go to the next one for resources, unless Ms. Hempy has anything else to add. No, I mean, I would, I would love to hear questions or conversation, anyone who, you know, has, you know. Well, and our resources too, we're gonna go through them, but we really are looking for a new, the, a next step for us. Ms. Hempy and I um, love this stuff. So we are just waiting for, um, you know, parent feedback and, and a love to learn more about. with us. Yeah. Well, there's two documentaries that uh, I think, you, you, Amanda, you mentioned uh, The Social Dilemma, yeah? Um, so this documentary called Childhood 2.0, I would not have your children watch it first, I would watch it yourself, but um, it's by a company called Bark, which they are an internet, like they are like kind of like an internet safety, they, they're like a watchdog, Bark, right? Um, for kids, and so they put out this documentary, and it's really interesting, but disturbing and important to talk about, better understand the world children are navigating. Like, what's it really like? Because we know what our kids tell us, and then they have their second account and their second Instagram and their second that nobody knows about, right? Um, they know what they're, you know, they know how to be savvy. They're really good at it, and they, they, you know, they just want to be with their friends and have fun. But there's, it's a, it's a wild, it's a wild west out there. Um, so what happens and what they encounter? The other documentary that was the social dilemma, which is really interesting. It's about persuasive design and the people who run. All these tech companies are like, oops, we didn't realize where we we just we just thought, we're so excited we could do it. We didn't think about what could happen with, you know, children and that. Um, just it's good knowledge. I, I told the kids to watch it in middle school because they should know what what's going on that the stuff they use. Um, the website that we got this from was Screen Time Children's Screen Time Action Network. It's a it's a subsidiary of Childhood uh, Com Commercial Free Child Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood which is all about protecting children's privacy and rights. Um, I actually went to a conference with them. It was amazing. Uh, I'm currently starting a book. Anna's going to read it called Glow Kids by Nicholas Coderis. It's really good. Uh, if you're interested in a book, and maybe we'll talk about it sometime next next semester. 
website, uh, full disclosure, my sister-in-law is the founder of this. It's called Screen Strong. It's a really good family resource if you want a ton of uh, suggestions, you know, non-techie gifts, whatever. And then um, we have Parenting Connect Screen Time website. Uh, Amanda, you had mentioned this other one at the bottom, that app. That's it. Yeah. Yes. So, so we have a few questions. Um, and uh, Ms. Hempy and I also have um, a, a link to a form if you're interested in learning with us and doing a book club or and a movie talk or discussion after one of the documentaries. Um, you know, we have this form and we're going to, um, should I attach it now? Do you think? Um, and then if you feel free to fill that out, and we can also email it as a follow up if you need it, um, just so we can know if you're interested in doing some next steps with us. Um, some questions, uh, any ideas about how to handle um, the kids online during this pandemic? They have to be online and they're good at finding ways to get to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I think uh, some good ideas that we had were, um, you know, when they're not in school, um, mandatory, get outside, run around, get some exercise. And then if you do need to do something else, you're gonna do it in the family space around the parents. Um, and then setting limitations. You have this much time to get it done. Uh, any other recommendations that you can think of, ladies? I have I have some stuff we've been doing, but like I think it it's harder the older your kids are. So like I mean, my kids are kindergarten and third grade. So basically, at the start of all this, I bought. Do you guys know those sticker books? They're like the um, there's a brand, and it's basically there's all these stickers, and the kids have to take them and like fit them in the scene that they're supposed to go to. So I bought like ten million of those, and so when they have you know their asynchronous time or a break where I'm trying to work. I like keep doling out these, you know, they have all the different themed ones, a Minecraft one, a Disney princess one, whatever. I'm doing like, um, my aunt bought my son who's in third grade, a uh, thing where you can collect quarters and like you have to put one for each state and something. We've got puzzles, you know, I mean, I, I do feel like I'm running out of things, but today mm -hmm. I've had them like create some sort of, um, you know, gym, gym, uh, contest, you know, uh, with their stuffed animals just to get them to like run around our basement. <laughs> yeah, that physical, physical movement is so important. Mm -hmm. um, I also, uh, I think, oh my God, I just had an idea that came to me and I'm losing it. Um, oh, for, what was it? Someone said socialize with each other. Oh, socializing is not bad. I think the issue is mm -hmm. that they're just on the screens longer, right? So I try to set up socializing play dates um, you know, after hours, after school, maybe a couple hours after their eyes have had a break. So it's not mm -hmm. just online longer and longer. I also do it on the weekends. Yeah. We have a couple weeks here where we can schedule some um, online time. So they're not online all day like they have been recently. Um, so just maybe spacing it out if they want to socialize with each other. I'm, that's what I do for my kids. Yeah, and, and I think that's, a, I was gonna say something along the same lines. You know, I, I think that we need to make some allowances for that because our kids aren't getting the socialization at school. And so if your normal policy would be, you know, you get 30 minutes uh, on a weeknight of screen time pre-pandemic, I think now you work in a little allowance for some social screen time, but have that conversation with your child and, and let them know the rationale. Like, yes, you know, I, I know that this is hard for you. I know that you don't get all of that, that time with your, your friends and your classmates. And so whereas our rule would normally be this, we're, we're gonna be flexible with you and, and this is the new parameter. Um, it's still, you're, you're having, you're making the, the boundary, you know, you're, but you're being logical and, and um, open about it with your child. But I think that there does need to be some room for that. You know, there might be some, some more screen time because of it, because that's how they get to connect. I mean, and I also wonder how much are these kids just like, picking up the phone and calling, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, does it always yeah, happen? I was going to say. We're, we're talking on roadblock. We're playing Roblox so we can chat with each other and talk through that, like pick up a phone and call. I used to love when the phone would ring when I was little. I, I am bringing know. back the landline phone. I have a landline. I'm giving it out to my friends, kids, parents. I say, call the landline. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah, exactly. And I was just, and Amanda, exactly. I was just going to say, 
it's kind of a novelty and kids love novelty to call someone on the phone and talk. Cause I think there's something, I know it's the way they talk, but just texting or liking a photo, it's not real connection. It's the way they think, they think they're connected. They think they have all these friends, but they really need just a couple really good friends that they can have conversations with. That's gonna fill them up. And what happens is they're on the social media and they feel really bad about themselves because only three people like their picture or nobody liked it at all or somebody said something or they were ignored. And they're getting, they're trying to get fulfillment from this mass group audience and they don't have that really close connection. Two to three friends, really good friends is all kids really need to sustain. So if you can do, like you said, on the phone, hey, call so-and-so or let's do a Zoom and everyone get a, you know, a Starbucks or everybody get your favorite ice cream and we'll do that and we'll talk, but they're looking at each other and they're talking. They're not just, I like your picture or here's another picture of me. And I think we need to guide them through that because they're just doing what everybody else is doing, which can be kind of dysfunctional at times because they're not, the connection is what they really want. That's all they want. And especially in, in middle school, it's all about their peers, but they need their families still there present. They need you. They don't say they do, but they do. It's the strongest thing you can do is give them that that solid connection. That's going to keep them from some of that other stuff that lures the kids in. Um, as for kind of controlling their, um, you know, their multitasking on on their devices yeah. during the school day, the one of the resources that I listed, the the Panda Security website does have some control features for things like Chrome. Um, it's for Chrome OS on Chromebook, but if you read through, you might see something that applies to the computer or that, you know, the device that your kid's using and it might, you might be able to set some controls to limit. Um, again, that Custodio app, uh, seems to be able to limit what a lot, it has a lot of controls. So it's, that's something to look into. Um, and I would also have a conversation with your child about, a, about attention. And, and if you have a middle schooler at Nettlehorst, I taught about executive function. I've spent the last three weeks. I did eighth grade um, two weeks ago. Last week I did seventh. And then this week I'm doing, I did sixth grade. And so we've talked about executive functioning. We, we went over, um, they, they self-assessed on the, diff, the 10, 10 of the different executive functioning skills. They got a digital workbook that explains each of those skills and strategies to strengthen them. So you can talk to them about focus. You can talk to them about sustained attention and and ask them like, what, how is that affecting your sustained attention? If while you've got your Google Meet over here, you have another tab with YouTube, you have another tab with a game, and and they'll they sh they have that language now. Sorry, kids. You're welcome, parents. To to follow that conversation, and um, they should all have a copy of that workbook. And you can ask them to open it up if they don't have a copy. The link is in their homeroom Google Classroom. <laughs> Great, thank you. I think that wraps it up for us. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight and listening. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Oh, Erica, I, well, what about Tuco and Blondie? Isn't it tonight the main party? I know, we all could use one, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thanks, coming, everybody. Everyone. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Yeah, well, for coming uh, on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what was that? I was just saying a lot, lot to think about, but thank you so much. And Anna, I did the form and I'm wondering, you know, if that's something that 